Good morning, scholars. Today we're going to continue with our complete Greek course. As we draw near the end, we'll be integrating more texts outside of Homer, both Xenophon and some New Testament. So here we are starting with the opening of Xenophon's Anabasis. Now, the Anabasis is uh, just reading from the wiki page is the most famous book of the ancient Greek professional soldier and writer Xenophon. The seven books making up the Anabasis were composed around 370 BC. The Anabasis is usually rendered in translation as the March of the 10,000 or as the March Up Country. The narration of the journey is Xenophon's best known work and quote, one of the great adventure stories of human history. Okay, so we'll be depending um, for our vocabulary on this wonderful creation of the great um, Greek scholar and university administrator, one of the founding fathers of the University of Chicago, uh, Mr. William Rainey Harper. His inductive Greek primer which um, just introduces you to Greek out of the text of, of Xenophon. So this will be found posted on my Patreon page, the PDF. And if anyone's curious, as you most certainly should be, you should take a look at it. But we'll be using it just for uh, the vocabulary. Now, of course, dealing as we are with Xenophon and the Anabasis, we are dealing with the Persian Empire. So you will see um, about in the middle of this map, you see Susa. That was the capital of the uh, Persian Empire. And then you see uh, to the left, Sardis in uh, what is now Turkey. And that was the Western capital, the one that later um, in Herodotus, the Greeks will famously burned down, beginning all the troubles that ended at Marathon, well, that continued at Marathon and the other battles. So uh, just to place this in time, we look at the Archimedid dynasty insofar as it falls under the umbrella of the Greek historians, because it is Herodotus who begins our story or our notice of the kings of Persia with Cyrus the Great after he um, conquers um, after he conquers um, Gyges, the uh, king of Lydia. And then um, we go through Cambyses II and then Darius the first, who it says here brought the empire to its greatest extent and was defeated by the uh, Greeks at Marathon. And then his son Xerxes, who led the great campaign that is chronicled in books uh, seven, eight, and nine of Herodotus. And then finally, we have to go down all the way to the last figure, the last two figures to see uh, Darius II, who will be mentioned in our opening passage that we are considering and the person who received this throne from him, Atazexes II. Um, so the events that we'll be chronicling, looking at this first opening sentence of Xenophon, actually occurred in 404 BC. And as we said earlier, uh, Xenophon eventually wrote this account up uh, some 34 years later. Okay. So to begin with our vocabulary, we have Atazexes, Gig no dai dare u de duo kai kiros men ne o deros pai des parusatados and presbuteros. So the opening bit. Dare u kai parusatados, 
Gegnon tai Baides duo. Presbuteros men, ata Xerxes, ne oteros de Giros. Now, um, I've marked here in yellow the participles. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, the particles, because uh, there was a very famous day in my study at uh, Berkeley where the great and eminent Greek scholar uh, Donald Mastinardi was uh, giving us a little lecture on in one of our Greek uh, tragedy seminars. He wanted to give a lecture on Aristotle's theory of tragedy in the politics, of uh, the poetics. And it was quite impressive because what he did was he didn't come in with notes or PowerPoints or anything. He simply strolled into class with the Greek text of the poetics and opened it to the section where um, <laughs> Aristotle treats of his views on tragedy. And he simply turned the pages of the Greek text and gave us a summation of the uh, Aristotle's teaching in this regard. Well, uh, he asked he asked if anyone had questions at the end, and some brave students just simply asked him, and it was, it was a very brave student who simply asked him, well, when you first look at a Greek text, how, you know, what are you looking for? What, do you, what are your first clues as to how to figure out the meaning? And I think everyone in the class was broadsided blindly by Professor Mastronardi's answer that the first thing you look at when you're reading a Greek text is the, the particles. You're aware of the particles because the particles set up the overall organization of what you're reading. So here in this first sentence, we have kai, we have a men, and we have a dad. So dare u kai parusatedos, gignon tai paides duo, presbuteros men, atar xerxes, ne oteros de kiros. So our kai obviously unites the two dare u kai parusatedos, these both being genitives, the first of the second uh, declension and the parusatados of the third. And so we start the sentence with these genitives, and they're basically genitives of origin. Dare u kai parusatados gignontai baides duo. Presbuteros men ataxerxes ne o deros de. Kiros. So here we have, after the Kai, which simply links the father and the mother, we have men saying, on the one hand, there was uh, the elder one, Atazerxes, and on the other hand, there was the younger one, Cyrus. So we see very clearly here the very, very common use of men and de to juxtapose two different figures in contrast. And we see as well the elision of the verb to be. There, we just have presbuteros men, ataxerxes, ne oteros de kiros. So our next group of vocabulary, astaneo, dareos, epe, Estene beos beu telute tu hupo hupop teuel and hupop teue. So, um, people who have been following this course know quite a lot more Greek than the people would who were following Harper's, this first lesson of Harper's course. So you should be able to recognize why he gives be os, be u, and you should be able to identify what declension and the other forms of uh, the other cases. And likewise, um, looking at six and seven, hupop de u o and hupop de u e, 
you should be able to understand why seven is recognizable as the imperfect third singular. Uh, regarding item number four at the top, a stane coming all out of item number one, as o, we haven't yet dealt with contract verbs, that is the verbs that um, have this epsilon or alpha or omicron before the omega of the first person um, or in the stem, but this as o, it is the uh, present of a stene, which is again an imperfect. We see the augment, the increase of the alpha to an eta, and then uh, the epsilon iota that results from the contraction of epsilon of the stem with epsilon of the ending of the imperfect. So a stene is an imperfect as well. And we will get to the contract verbs ultimately. So we have epede estene dareos kai hu pop teu e teluten tu piu. Again, epede estene dareos kai hu pop teu e teluten tu piu. Now, the next set of vocabulary. Um, potero, um, potero, pulomai, e buleto, paide, para, paenai, and to. Now, um, I only talk about paenai because we have not dealt with eme, the uh, me verb that means to uh, I am, but par ani, we'll see that in a second, means to be beside, to be present. So again, am paltero, bu lamai, e bu leto, the imperfect um, third singular of bu lamai, baide, the dual two sons, para, beside, we have not dealt with prepositions yet, but Para plus ani, you get to be beside, to be present, to be on hand. And then to, the dual singular accusative, nominative, vocative of the uh, definite article. So, ebuleto to paide ampotero par ani. Ebuleto to paide ampotero par ani. So what's going on with this last word here, this infinitive? Well, we've already seen this elsewhere, but the, this is an object infinitive after verbs of will or desire. So it's Smyth 1991. We read that verbs of will or desire and their opposites are often followed by an infinitive. The infinitive with the subject accusative denotes that something should or may be or be done. The negative is meh. So at 1992, Smythe gives you a wonderful list of verbs that, um, verbs of will or desire that take the infinitive and have an accusative object. So we see uh, bulamai, wish or will, and I invite you to uh, explore these verbs and learn them. So a buleto to paide am potero par enai. So in our whole our whole passage, dareu kai paru satedos gignon tai paides duo. Presbuteros men atazexes ne oteros de giros. Epede estene dareos kai upop de ue. Teluten to biu, e buleto to paide am potero paenai. So let's look at the particles of the second bit. So we have epede, this is de as its progressive, in its progressive use, just carrying on the narrative. And when, uh, and then kai, 
kai links together the two verbs, e spene kai hupop deue. And um, I'd like to note as well that the telutain to biu, we see an example where the uh, to, the definite article, does the work of the possessive, um, suspecting the end of his life. E buleto to paide ampotero pa enai. Okay, so there we have it. Um, I'll read it one more time just for the sake. Dare u kai para satedos gignon tai paides duo, presbuteros men atazexes ne o teros de kiros. Epede estene dareos kai hupop tue teluten tu biu. Epuleto to paide ampotero pa enai. Now, I've said previously that one's Greek is only as strong and certain as one's knowledge of principal parts. So you should always uh, isolate the verbs of your passage and make sure that you know those principal parts. So here we have gignomai, and then we have the bit from Smythe's index of verbs, which we want to concentrate mainly on the uh, figures that he has, the, the entries that he has in bold. So that leaves us with gignomai, genesomai, egenomain, gegona, and gegenemai. And people who have been following this course should know what tenses each of these represent. So I highly recommend that you just stop right now, pause, and write out these five forms together maybe eight or ten times. Uh, to begin to get them into your head. Gignomai, genesomai, egenomain, gegona, gegenemai. Likewise, par eme, we haven't treated eme yet, but you see that this, I had to take this from um, Lindell and Scott to mean to be by, to be present, but we see looking at the bottom, that what's really important here is just to realize that the future has middle forms. So, S-O-M-I, S-A, S-T-I, um, etc. That's what you really uh, have to take away. And likewise, the participle, S-O-M-E-N-O-S, s o m n a s o m e n o n and the, even the infinitive, hes s t i And then finally, Bulomai, we have the forms Bulomai, Bulesomai, Bebulemai, Ebuletain, and finally Buletos. Let's stop and look at Ebuletain. And remember here that this is actually a passive deponent, which means that this, what looks like an aorist passive form, Ebuletain, will have an active meaning and will serve simply as your aorist of bulomai. Now the final form, buletos, is something we have not talked about yet. These are the verbal adjectives, and so we read from Smice 472. Verbals in tos te ton, either, one, have the meaning of a perfect passive participle, as in kruptos, hidden, Paideutos, educated, or they express possibility, no etos, thinkable, or ratos, visible. Many have either signification, but some are passive only. Poietos, done. Usually passive in meaning are verbals from deponent verbs. So, mimnetos, imitated. So, here, a uh, uh, buletos, being as it is from a deponent verb, it means like wished for, his wished for outcome, buletos. Okay, so that's it for our passage today and our review of principal parts. I hope to see you soon. I end with this picture of Mr. Harper, and I can't imagine the image of a superhuman of Greek and Hebrew 
and university administration uh, more fitting than this wonderful photo of Mr. Harper. Okay, so have a good day, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you for your interest. Goodbye.